Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Stern, and I'm the director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish, and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. Gustav Metzger was a visionary artist and radical thinker. His legacy is profoundly rooted in activism in both the political and artistic realms. And I quote, at the beginning, I was confronted with a choice, move into art or, or revolutionary politics, he says. I took the path of art at the age of 18, quote M. Today, I'm excited to welcome you to Becoming Gustav Metzger, uncovering the early years 1945 to 1959. This is an event of our monthly virtual lecture series, Flight of Fight, Stories of Artists Under Repression. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Nicola Baird. After her presentation, we'll have time to ask questions, so please submit them in the chat function. Nicola Baird is the co-curator of the first museum exhibition to examine the little known formative years of refugee artist and activist Gustav Metzger which just opened at Ben Uri Gallery and Museum in London and is on view until September 17, 2021. She's a research officer and curator at the Ben Uri Research Unit of Ben Uri Gallery and Museum London. She's currently studying for a PhD in history of art at London South Bank University in collaboration with Ben Uri. As a guest curator at Berghaus, she was the initi initiator of the Arts Council funded exhibition, The Making of an Englishman, Fred Ullmann, a retrospective. Held at Berghaus before touring to the Hatton Gallery in Newcastle in 2018, an editor of the accompanying publication. In 2019, she curated Czech Roots to Britain, selected Czechoslovak artists in Britain from the Ben Uri private collections at Benuri, and for which she edited the accompanying catalog. Welcome, Nicola Baird. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and for this opportunity to share with you the unknown early work of refugee artist, activist, and environmentalist Gustav Metzger. As Rachel mentioned, uh, the subject of my lecture today is Becoming Gustav Metzger, Uncovering the Early Years, 1945 to 59, the title of an exhibition currently open and on view at Ben Uri Gallery in London, the first museum ex exhibition to exclusively examine Metzger's little known formative years prior to the development of his later radical auto-destructive practice for which he's better known. The exhibition showcases rarely seen drawings and paintings from this crucial early period, the majority never exhibited. Along with related archival material, while a more extensive offering will also be available online at benuri.org, designed to showcase the breadth of Metzger's early work executed on conventional as well as unusual found supports, including paper, canvas, and board, as well as cardboard, plastic, and sheets of mild steel. Both the physical and the online exhibitions chart Metzger's artistic journey from figuration to abstraction, while simultaneously uncovering an intriguing episode in the artist's own personal narrative. The works on view have been selected from a large hoard of works that for reasons unknown, Metzger hid from public view in the North London attic of a relative for 45 years and rediscovered in 2009 on the eve of his solo exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery before retrieving in November 2010. Their storage within a domestic context explains their often fragile, in some cases, damaged material condition, which serves only to enrich their story of survival. Metzger rarely signed or dated his work, thus even establishing a conventional chronology is no simple task. Uncatalogued and under research, many of these works remain at this exciting stage in what is inevitably an ongoing process of discovery. Even questions relating to their correct orientation are not always easily answered. Yet together this body of work allow us to follow the artist's embryonic and highly exploratory journey towards becoming the Gustav Metzger of later fame. Now to delve into the artist's biography and to put a number of the works exhibited into context. 
Gustav Metzger was born in 1926 in Nuremberg, home to the second largest Jewish community in Bavaria. Many were recent arrivals from other parts of Europe, including Metzger's parents, Judah and Fanny, who had immigrated from Poland in 1918, from Poland in 1918. After 1938, the situation for Jews in Nuremberg became insupportable, and beginning with the deportation of his father and sisters to Poland, Metzger's family began to disintegrate under the pressure and of Nazi politics and practices. His mother voluntarily joined his father at a detention camp near the Polish-German border, while his sisters fled to Sweden, later immigrating to Israel. His parents and eldest brother perished in the years to come. Sorry. Um, as did his grandparents and many other close relatives. Metzger and his older brother, Max, however, were rescued and sent to Britain as Polish citizens under the auspices of the refugee children's movement. They arrived in England along with five other, 500 other refugee children on 12th of January, 1939. They were initially housed in Butlin's holiday camp and subsequently in a, host, in a hostel for refugee children in London. Metzger later recalled, my first contact with Great Britain was arriving at Harwich from Holland by boat. And after a few weeks on the coast, we were transported to London by bus. My first experience of London was thousands of car lights as we passed through the traffic, something I had never seen before, coming from the relatively small town of Nuremberg. In 1941, Gustav and Max Metzger, along with the boys' school they attended in London, were evacuated to Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire. In September of that year, Metzger began a three-year cabinetry course in Leeds, studying woodwork at a technical college set up by the Organisation for Rehabilitation Through Training and Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants, Children's Aid Society. Instruction ceased after a year due to heavy German bombing of the city, and yet, despite such a premature conclusion, his stay in Leeds proved crucial for it was on visits to Temple Newsom House that he first encountered the work of Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth, as well as other leading modernists, including Graham Sutherland, Matthew Smith, Jacob Epstein, Paul Nash, John Piper and Gaudia Breschka. After working in a furniture factory and workshop in and near Leeds, in 1944 Metzger moved to Clifton, Bristol, where he lived in a commune of Trotsky anarchists. Instead of becoming a professional revolutionary, he said, I realized that utopia wasn't for me. He chose the way of art and sculpture, recalling, it was a total commitment. When the decision was made, I knew that this would be forever. It was a kind of conversion, very sudden, in a way unexpected. In August of that year, whilst working in the organic garden at Shapney's Nature Cure Clinic near Tring, Metzger began carving his first sculptures, strongly influenced by Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore, from small pieces of Honiton stone, which he eventually had to leave behind because they couldn't be moved. Others, made in Cambridge from Portland stone, were small and figurative, reminiscent of Moore's work during the 1930s. Metzger approached Moore with a letter, and when they met at the National Gallery in London, asked the sculptor to take him on as his assistant. Moore recommended that he first attend life drawing classes. As a result, he spent about six months at the Cambridge School of Art before moving to London in 1945 and enrolling at the Sir John Cass Institute to study sculpture and drawing and almost simultaneously in evening life classes at the Borough Polytechnic taught by British painter David Bomberg. In Metzger's own words, I remember walking into the life room and there was a small man who looked sort of unprepossessing. It was David Bomberg. But within a few weeks, one realized that this was not an ordinary person. He was charismatic, had enormous experience, and he was, I think, a great artist. He recalls, in 1945 to 46, when I entered the class, I was introduced to drawing that was completely different to what I'd been doing in Cambridge which had involved following the outline of the figure to make a realistic interpretation. Bomberg said, forget about that. Go for the structure, go for the center and use the full weight of the body. 
Bomberg encouraged his students to work with the whole of the body. He emphasized it wasn't, it isn't just the hand, it's everything going through the entire system, which then is expressed on the page or on the canvas. This relates to abstract, abstract expressionism, to the American developments going on at the same time. And for Metzger, it was the beginning of a move towards the end result, towards dealing with the central salient points of the figure, rather than with the detail, going to the heart of the matter. In the first three months, Metzger reflected, Bomberg got me involved in drawing in a way that was completely new to me. I gravitated towards ink in his class, nowhere else. I hadn't used it before, and there the inspiration was Godier. Describing this period as my Godier phase, he remembers that Bomberg was very intrigued by and encouraged by such work which although not executed using Bomberg's technique, he could see I was doing fresh work and that was different to everybody else in the class, often completing six or perhaps even 10 drawings, always on big sheets of paper. Bomberg subsequently invited Metzger to join his painting and composition class in addition to the evening life drawing class. Metzger later claimed, I never thought of painting. It never occurred to me recalling, so I started and it went very well. I was painting, using only oil on board, usually rather than canvas. I liked it, I preferred it. The paintings Metzger made in Bomberg's composition class, several of which are included in the exhibition, were all abstract. He remembers, I started off with a skeletal figure in the moonlight, which Bomberg touched with brownish paint, thought to be self-portrait and undefiled which you can see on screen now, the title of which can be translated from the German inscription. Then I started on a very large work and that was abstract, Dissolution of the City, also completed in 1946, which depicted the struggle between East and West London, influenced by futurism, before completing another painting on a similar scale, depicting a movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony Eroica Funeral March, influenced by Kandinsky and his concern with music. Interestingly, Metzger recalls that Bomberg didn't like this painting. He said, you are more genuine than Kandinsky and I can see what he meant. I was really putting everything in. Bomberg advised Metzger to apply for a grant offered by the Nathan and Adolf Handler charity, which, which would support his full time studies for the next two years. Metzger reflected on his relationship with Bomberg. First of all, he was my teacher and the one I was interested in more than any other. He always influenced the way I was painting or drawing. He was also a friend and a supporter. He worked with me, but also for me, and he became a former father figure. There was a difference in age, but he was of Polish Jewish origin, just like my family. There was so much that brought us together not only in relation to art and shared family history, but also in relation to politics. That was one reason we got on so well. Intuitively, he realized that I was interested in the same things he was interested in. During these early years in London, in addition to taking classes at the Sir John Cass Institute, the Borough Polytechnic, and the newly founded Anglo-French Art Center in St. John's Wood, Metzger also took the opportunity to spend time in the British Museum Library, studying a variety of topics, including embryology, which would subsequently feature heavily in his work. The heat of the summer of 1947 had forced Metzger to abandon outdoor sculptural work, confining his artistic activities to his East End studio shack off Commercial Road in East London, where he swapped carving for painting. I was intrigued by painting, and I did a series of paintings which are completely different to what I was doing with Bomberg. They were compositions inspired by embryology. Elaborating, he recalls, I would transpose embryonic images and circular images, concluding, this was my surrealist phase. Works were made using home ground paint on boards which Metzger was able to pick up for nothing or next to nothing. One such work, his biggest to date, 
executed on tapestry tripartite room divider was exhibited as Woman with Child the following year in a group show at Benyuri Art Gallery's Portman Street premises in the spring exhibition of 1948 and subsequently at Bomberg's suggestion in the London group exhibition at Academy Hall under the revised title Hospital Mural Womb Man and priced at 40 pounds. Metzger was proud to remember that they really gave it a sort of special place and it was special. It was my only triptych. Made with egg tempera, largely in black, white and grey, he felt it was his best painting. For it was unlike anything that I'd done in Bomberg's class and it was in a more circular form and it was in monochrome. The other paintings were all rather colourful. It had a harmony. The series of paintings on board Metzger refers to from this period may also include two untitled paintings depicting contra contrasting and yet surreal encounters between male and female figures and seated women, tentatively dated 1945 to 47, now on screen. Metzger spent the summer of 1948 traveling on the continent. Having applied for a stateless rather than a Polish passport, believing it was more organic for me to be stateless than British, Polish or Israeli, an affirmation of the past and an ongoing integration with the past. He set out on an art historical journey of sorts. He spent time in Holland, Belgium and France before enrolling for a year at the Antwerp Art Academy, where he was taught by Belgian graphic artist and favorite painter Gustave de Bruyne. He had secured a grant to fund his studies in Antwerp through the city's Jewish community. And as a result, Metzger remembers drawing and painting from the model every day, and that in my spare time, I would spend hours and hours in the streets drawing children. I made hundreds of drawings on blue paper with pencil influenced by the Renaissance, including portrait and head of a man on screen now. There he also completed the Expressionist paintings, Head, 1948, and Antwerp model, 1949, both of which are included in the exhibition. The latter, one of Metzger's most arresting works of the period, depicts a conventional seated female figure, transgressively transformed, as art historian and curator Andrew Wilson has noted, into something half animal. He returned to Britain in the autumn of 1949 and spent the winter at the Oxford School of Art, now Oxford Brookes University, before re resuming evening classes with Bomberg at the Borough Polytechnic. Although not a member of the Borough Group, it was from this point onwards that he developed a real closeness with Bomberg, attending his classes twice weekly until 1953. Bomberg urged his students to seek out and attend exhibitions in London as often as they could. As a pupil of Bomberg's, Metzger was granted free entry to the Leicester Galleries, where he saw a lot of Epstein, whilst also frequenting Zwemer Gallery's bookshop and artist, author and legendary, legendary bohemian Jack Bilbo's Modern Art Gallery on King Charles II Street. In fact, it was Epstein's support by way of a letter of recommendation that led to an extension of Metzger's Handler Trust grant for another year. His full-time study was therefore funded up until the end of 1950, same year in which he executed a thickly painted portrait commissioned by its subject, Ernest Royalton Kish, the solicitor who facilitated Metzger's grants from the Handler Trust. Following the disintegration of the Borough Group in 1951, Metzger was also involved together with fellow pupils of Bomberg, Cliff Holden and Miles Richmond, in arranging an exhibition for some of its former members, but in the end, work by Metzger was not included. That same year, Metzger completed a sequence of studies and finished paintings based on an ink drawing made in Antwerp, titled and dated, Homage to a Starving Poet, 7th of April 1949. 
The series relates to Metzger's memory, not long after he began attending Bomberg's classes, of having been warned by his teacher that, if you want to be an artist, you must be prepared to starve. The number of works executed is also suggestive, as Andrew Wilson notes, of the importance that this subject had for him in reinforcing his own identity as both a refugee and an artist. To embrace such a willingness to suffer was an indication of his commitment to shoulder the responsibilities of being an artist. Three of these studies, along with a number of the other works on display, would subsequently be exhibited at Metzger's retrospective, Paintings and Drawings, 1945 to 1960, at the Temple Gallery, London, in 1960. As Wilson also observes, although one painting follows the drawing closely, the other paintings exchange the thin, jagged strokes of the pen for a lattice of short staccato brushstrokes that represent a group of three figures arranged in a triangular composition with one figure to the side echoing both depictions of the circumstances of Christ's crucifixion, as well as traditional representations of prophets with followers or supplicants on either side. Bomberg's teaching then continued to be inspirational for Metzger, not only in practical terms, but also because of his belief in art's potential to act as a social force. For as Bomberg asserted, it is the example the artist gives of fulfilling himself in his work that is of social use to others. Also dating from this time are at least two life drawings, reclining nudes, one in charcoal and the other in black paint or watercolour, featuring what are thought to be Bomberg's corrections in orange chalk. In addition to the as yet unidentified head of Auerbach, 1952, listed among the works displayed as part of Metzger's Temple Gallery retrospective, as having been drawn by David Bomberg and Metzger. In the summer of 1953, Metzger was one of a small number of Bomberg's pupils who came together to form not a group, but a grouping of students who would exhibit together, known as the Borough Bottega. In Metzger's own words, the Bottega was largely my idea and was intended as a nice gesture and if you like, a mark of my appreciation. Having taken the initiative with starting this new group and as definitely its most active member, after class, Metzger would often accompany Bomberg on the bus back to Hampstead and would sometimes be invited into his house in Belsize Park, North London, where he would often get out from under his bed bundles of papers and press cuttings and encouraged Metzger to get deeper into his chronology, his biography. At this point, Metzger began to think, well, somebody must write about him, and approached art historian, critic and collector, Douglas Cooper, and Ukrainian-born editor and author, Jacob Sontag, founder in 1953 of Jewish Quarterly, among others. The letter dated 27th of April, 1953, asked Cooper if he would be interested in writing a book on the work of David Bomberg or in assisting with the organizing of a major retrospective exhibition of his work and or with the catalog. Critic and curator Pontus Kayander believes the letter to Cooper gives important insight into the methods Metzger was absorbing from his teacher, quoting Metzger's assertions that one must be concerned not only with the model or the mountain, but also with the elements of the environment, including the world of the student while painting and drawing, and that the structure of the painting should be expressive as of a total realization as possible and should be built with a minimum of conscious reflection. No more than two months after the letter to Cooper was written, Metzger decided that he would write what he referred to as a treatise on Bomberg, at which point Metzger approached critic Herbert Reed, among others, for relevant information. By this time, he had moved out of London, passing his studio near Mornington Crescent on to Leon Kossoff, who subsequently passed it on to Frank Auerbach. Both uh, pupils of Bomberg's also at the Borough Polytechnic. Commuting from Kings Langley in Hertfordshire, Metzger recalls that sometimes I traveled 50 miles to get to his class. 
indicative of the fact that I was fully committed and reconciled to the relationship of teacher and student. This was a relationship, however, that was soon to become very complicated. Metzger's opposition to the Bottega's first exhibition, giving too much space to Bomberg and his closest family, resulted in his resignation from the group. In Metzger's own words, you rebel against the father and you rebel against the teacher. This, that was part of it. He felt that having put all that effort in to building up Bomberg as far as I could and taking part in the first exhibition, which took place at the Barclay Galleries and in which Metzger exhibited two works, Model and Clown, both listed as oils and priced at 50 guineas, as well as expressing the desire to organize exhibitions in Oxford and Cambridge, I saw that although we had a constitution that the central aim is in fact to help Bomberg, I could see that David and Lillian Bomberg weren't satisfied. He reflects that it was evident that they wanted more and I felt that that was incompatible with the aims of the Bottega and my own position. Despite resigning from the group, Metzger made it clear to Bomberg that he would still be very happy to continue working with him. A few weeks later, however, he received a letter out of the blue in which Bomberg unexpectedly and unceremoniously cut all ties with his former favored pupil. Thinking I could help you was a mistake. In trying, I have done myself little honor and earned a great deal of damage. You should have been content with the amount of interest and helpfulness the other students were given. It was your duty to, to see that you did not exceed this and I did not realize the implications, the injustices I was doing and the havoc I was performing whilst I was being kind to you. Your resignation from the Borough Bottega is according to your own thinking and needs no comment from me. The shock of having received such a letter and the betrayal it involved addressed to Metzger's home in Kings Lynn, Norfolk, may have precipitated an almost three year period in which he didn't paint though during which time he did apply to be a member of the Ben Uri Gallery. By 1956, however, he felt ready to begin again. Painting rather than drawing increasingly abstract figures. A female figure in green gray is almost impossible to pick out of the gloom in one of two major canvases, Girl at Bus Window, 1956. For Metzger, of course, the paintings of this period all relate to Bomberg, but they're all different to the work I was doing with Bomberg. They're rather thin painted, and also the paintings are rather different from each other. He revealed the fact too, that there weren't many. I would spend weeks on each one. Bomberg's influence is evident in Metzger's approach to such compositions, and to, the extent his, and to some extent his dealing with color though he tended towards a far darker palette than his teacher. The structural attack he learned from Bomberg is still visible, and yet the speed of attack in his paintings from 1956 was, in, was emphasized by his decision to paint with a palette knife. Prior to his relocation to Norfolk, he had painted with brushes almost entirely, but in Kings Lynn, he began to paint only with a palette knife. Almost simultaneously, he started to engage himself in local environmental issues and the emerging anti-nuclear movement. Additional influences on his work at this time included contemporary art magazines, modern and contemporary art magazine, art exhibitions. I would go to art galleries in London, including the ICA and the Whitechapel Gallery, visiting the 1956 This Is Tomorrow exhibition repeatedly as well as the metavisual Tashist abstract painting in England today, a pivotal 1957 exhibition at the Redfern Gallery. Composed almost exclusively of works of painterly abstraction by Peter Lanyon, Patrick Heron, Ben Nicholson and Sandra Blow, amongst others, it was an exhibition in which Metzger felt his work might find a place. He showed two works, including Girl at Bus Stop, to Redfern's director, Rex Nan Cavill. They were not accepted, however, angering Metzger and provoking an emotional response, which resulted in what would be a long 
a lifelong rejection of the Bond Street dealer system. Also dating from 1956 are paintings and a much greater quantity of drawings, many in colored chalks, depicting a three-legged occasional table, four of which are included in the exhibition. Such works might be seen to reflect Metzger's increasingly anti-nuclear sentiment. And yet about this series of paintings, he has also suggested a connection to the tablet of Moses. Of his religious upbringing and its effect on his artistic practice, Metzger reflected, I was raised in an, a Jewish Orthodox environment. So there was a fascinating clash in my youth between art and the Jewish ins insistence on the prohibition of, on images. This is at the center of my work. On the one hand, opening up to the world and on the other, closing off from it. I arrived in Britain as a refugee when I was 12 years old. So it never came to the point of choosing between art and tradition because by the time I would have been faced with such choices, I had already left my hometown and gone in a completely new direction. He has also spoken, however, in conversations with author and curator Brona Ferron of grappling for years with the central question, how might a Jewish person make art? as well as the ways in which he was circling Judaism with respect to making images of the human figure. Such statements relate in interesting ways to a series of drawings thought to relate from 1945 to 46 in varying sizes and styles of a family seated around a table, which Metzger asserted represented his own family, as well as one of his earliest memories of being bathed as a child by his mother. By the 1950s, Metzger had begun to incorporate new methods and materials into his practice. Successfully experimenting with painting on alternative, often found materials, including cardboard and plastic, as well as sheets of mild steel collected in London. He describes the decision to paint on steel as an inevitable development realizing his desire to work with something harder, more resilient. Those which he refers to in an interview with art writer, curator and librarian Clive Philpott as his final paintings were executed on two large oblong sheets of steel, one in red and the other in blue. Across the painted and incised surface of the latter, which is on screen now, intuitively and at random, he added white chalk, reflecting later, certainly I was aware that it would smudge off and that wouldn't matter. A trace of the chalk would be there. He asserts, I didn't paint again because there I summed up my capacities and my interest in painting. The chalk is the end and the beginning of the next phase of painting. And yet there are a small number of later paintings on found plywood boxes used to contain Kodak photographic paper, two of which are included in the exhibition. However, which because of the visibility of inspection markings are likely dated to circa 1961 to 62. Two paintings on mild steel and an earlier painting on board featured in three paintings, an exhibition of Metzger's work at 14 Monmouth Street, London a coffee shop for artists run by Welsh kinetic artist Brian Robbins in August 1959, marking Metzger's return to London. Michael Bullock, writing in the accompanying handout, explained that Metzger paints the world as it is seen under the influence of speed. Speed has a curious effect on objects. It draws them out, distorting their shape, throwing into relief certain aspects of their form and causing other elements to vanish altogether. Such speed is reflective of Metzger's long held desire as expressed to Bromberg in 1946, for painting to be fast and intense, as well as to, experience, as well as to his experience of Bromberg's classes in which students were encouraged to draw and to paint energetically in upright strokes as a result of their mentor's gift to the class 
the energy being presented and magically drawn out into the room. In June 1960, Metzger had returned to his studio in Kings Lynn to develop his ideas of a radical auto-destructive art practice by means of painting with hydrochloric acid on sheets of nylon. While former pupil and borough group member Roy Oxlade believed that all that side of Metzger's work, which subsequently developed into his auto-destructive vision, is absolutely alien to Bromberg's teaching and must, I think, be seen as an aberration. Metzger disagreed. There is a fundamental relationship between myself as a favorite pupil of Bomberg and my ongoing development as an artist, including my paintings in King's Lynn, which was of course a direct continuation, including my first acid action painting at the Temple Gallery, in particular, where you can see the brushstrokes could be by Bomberg or by one of his central pupils. The maintenance of such an affinity with Bomberg his teaching, his practice and his maxims are for Metzger to be expected, explaining that spending eight years of your youth with one person who dominates you, who is dominant, but who you almost merge with, inevitably resulted in his continuing the rest of my life under the influence of Bomberg, and it affected the techniques I used and the manner I used them in, and the ideals I have on art and the relationship to society especially in terms of responsibility, which undoubtedly was a central feature. Musing, Metzger perceived the situation much later. All those years of my being a student, starting in January 1945, I asked myself how art can contribute to saving society, to changing society. Having come to the fundamental belief that art should have the power to influence other people and influence the world, as recently as 1995, Metzger suggested to Wilson that Bomberg's aphorism, the search for the spirit in the mass, could still be applied to much of his own work. And yet his foundation and creation of a decade's worth of decades worth of autodestructive art goes way beyond Bomberg. Indeed, this is the point young artists have to go beyond their masters. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to say uh, before handing back over to Rachel that um, we have an exhibition catalog to accompany the exhibition. Um, I don't know if you can see that, um, which is um, available to buy online. Um, and um, that we will be having um, a series of exhibitions also uh, featuring much more work available to view at benury.org very soon. Um, and the details are up on the screen now of the exhibition um, and the website uh, where you can also uh, book for upcoming um, events in, in the series that I've organised um, relating to Gustav Metzger's early work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicola. Uh, this was a fascinating talk. And um, now we'll open the event to questions. So please post your questions in the Q&A or the chat function. Um, and I believe Leanne uh, um the curator, is in the audience. So I hope she'll be able to answer questions uh, as well. Um, so. David is asking, could you elaborate a little bit on Metzger's relationships to the better known students of Bromberg, like Lucian Freud, Auerbach, Kossoff, and so on? Um, yeah, well, I suppose that the main thing was that they were all students at the same time, particularly Kossoff and um, Auerbach. Um, beyond that, I don't think they really did have relationships with each other. I mean, um, Metzger did um, portray uh, Auerbach on a couple of occasions. Um, as I mentioned, there was a work in his um, 1960 exhibition, a retrospective that he himself organized um, that included a work um, or ahead of Frank Auerbach by Metzger and Bomberg. And um, we, we think that that, may, that, that work um, is one that we've included in, in the exhibition at Ben Uri, um, but it, it is subject to debate. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so and, and apart from the fact that they that he also passed on his studio, as I mentioned, to Kossoff and then to Albach. Um, but aside from that, I don't think there is really a relationship, particularly with, with their work specifically. Um, mm -hmm. is, that I mean, the, is that the studio that Auerbach is still in? Yes, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Love to be able to visit him there. <laughs> yes, yes, well, we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is quite. I mean, uh, uh, isn't it? Isn't it somehow strange that there was no um, closer relationship? Because um, Auerbach and, uh, came also on the Kinder Transport, so they were kind of all in the same situation. I don't know about. Um, Lucian Freud and Kossoff, did they also come on the Kinder Transport? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that Freud was a people of Bombergs, um, actually, but... Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I suppose any other similarities would be in terms of, uh, you know, the thick thick texture, um, the, the portrait that I showed of Ernest Royalton Kitsch um, mm -hmm. is, is quite thickly painted, especially in the, in the face area, and obviously Auerbach is well known for his his thickly painted works um, and to some extent the, the use of kind of dark colors um, in that 50s period um, but you know they then went on to do such different things and um, as hopefully you've been able to see from some of the slides um, and as you will be able to see more from the online exhibitions on view soon um, the range of, of Metzger's work from this early period is just so vast um, and as he said, he was doing, you know, different things to what other people were doing in Bombay's classes. He had this Gaudio Brej cafes and uh, was using ink. And then he, uh, you know, had this surreal phase. And um, so I think whilst Bomberg, you know, was a huge, huge influence on Metzger and his practice throughout his life, um, you know, that there were stylistic differences even early on. Yeah. So did did Bomberg? I mean, uh, Metzger uh, mentioned that Bomberg was a lifelong influence on him, uh, and of course, I can I can see that as you know, uh, eight years of uh, in youth uh, would influence your your whole um, outlook on life, especially if your parents and your family is not around. Um, but did Bomberg see that the same way? Was he? proud of him as a student or um yeah I think absolutely I mean until the until the sort of falling out moment which was in 53 they they were very close and especially in in the um very late 40s and early 50s Bomberg was yeah very much taking Metzger under his wing and um you know not only with his work but encouraging encouraging him to also pursue um Metz, I mean, sorry, Bomberg's own um, chronology and, and work on exhibitions with him. Mm. Um, and obviously he was, um, Metzger himself was very influential in the forming of this group around Bomberg, which mm. he was obviously very supportive of the, the Barra Bottega, which, um, you know, which he then resigned from obviously, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think he would, he would have seen the fact that they were, both, they, they were close as well, yeah. Right, right. So Robert is actually clarifying. Lucian Freud definitely uh, was not on the Kinder Transport. I think his father, the architect Ernst, Ernst Freud, uh, was in the UK from 1933. And he also says it was a Warner's camp, I think, and not a Woodlands camp at Dover Court Bay near Harwich, pronounced Harwich, okay, the, the W sign, where kinder transport children were initially placed when they arrived in the UK. Uh, uh, so um, do you know more where he was placed? I, I believe they were placed in different um, camps, no? Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that may be correct. So thank you for that information. But I mean, the only um, information I have here is, is that um, when they were sent to Britain, they arrived um, and, yeah, were initially housed in Butlin's holiday camp um, and then subsequently in a hostel in London. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid I can't elaborate any more on that at this moment, but um, yeah. I'll definitely look into it. There seems to be a lot of research on kinder transports right now, and children are coming into yeah. the UK and, mm -hmm. and also coming in the into the US. So hopefully, if that hasn't been researched, maybe with this big uh, on <laughs> uh, research effort, this uh, uh, more information about that will come out. You mentioned that um, he came, um, Metzger came with his brother. Did they? Yeah. Did they stay in touch? Were they close to each other or how did, uh, how was that? Yes. Um, yeah, they were initially very close. Um, and, you know, both uh, took up the calling of art making. Um, they both wanted to be sculptors. Um, they both went to Leeds initially um, and they both attended the Cambridge School of Art um, and subsequently the St. John Cass Institute where they studied sculpture and drawing. Um, and Max also did attend Bomberg's classes as well. Um, so they, they were close for a while. Um, wh when Metzger traveled to uh, Europe, that was also with Max, but he stayed on, I believe, um, on the continent whilst Metzger returned to London. Um, so yeah, they were definitely very close. Um, I, I believe they then sort of uh, drifted apart um, due to the fact they weren't living in the same place. But um, yeah, I wonder if Leanne, if she's listening, has any more to contribute on that? Um, I don't see her commenting here. Um, Ronak said, Kos uh, uh, comments, Kosov was of course London born. He was from a Russian Jewish immigrant background. So yeah. Um, uh, slowly, that information is rolling in. So, did the uh, so um, I also read that his sisters, Metzger's sisters, came to England via Sweden. So, two sisters survived as well. Uh, was there a relationship or? Um... Yeah, his sisters. Um... Let me just check. Yes, his sisters fled to Sweden and later immigrated to Israel. Um, yeah, they, they may have come to London in the intervening time. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I think Leanne has commented back there. Yes, she says Max became an art historian subsequently. So he uh, joined the other side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they definitely shared, you know, many interests. And <laughs> yeah, do you? Do oh, you she's also yeah she said something about the, his sisters yeah. yeah and leanne says no i don't think i believe his sisters did ever travel to the uk mm -hmm. um, that's what i thought yeah so probably there was not much of a yeah i don't know how much of a connection there was um yeah something to be shared more light on there yes so uh did Metzger um, later on when he did this big shift in his in his art making um, did he also exhibit uh, in in Germany did he have a big name uh, uh, in in Germany for for the art he made because I I think um, I can only imagine that people that it resonated very much with people's experiences yeah, I mean, I believe um, he, well, he, he did exhibit in Ge Germany, definitely in his later life. Um, I don't believe he did during during this early period that I'm looking at. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think he'd, he'd sort of even gone back during during that period, but definitely uh, much later in his career, he, he absolutely had shows in Germany. Um, yeah. Actually, Robert writes back. Um, uh, thank you so much, Robert. You're shedding a lot of light on, on different questions. Um, my husband's aunt, Miriam Mayer, a pupil at Anna Esslinger's school at Wunscourt, in its UK incarnation, greeted the kinder transport children when they arrived with Anna Esslinger. Her sister, the artist Eva Altbog, pictures, uh, uh, who has pictures in Ben Uri collection, knew Auerbach and had pictures by Kossel. 
So that's. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, fascinating. That's where the whole I think <laughs> the <laughs> closes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very, uh, very interesting. So, um, Metzger never married, right? Um, he no. Um, yeah. I mean, I've 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 been able to look into this a tiny bit through. Uh, interviews that he conducted with Clive Philpot, who I mentioned in my talk, um, and and during those he he does discuss this this subject, and um, he was conflicted at one point in his early years, um, and definitely made work sort of relating to kind of relationships between men and women, um, including paintings and a particular sculpture that he was working on um, that there's no kind of photographic evidence of because it was actually destroyed at the time, but on a building site opposite the St. John Cass Institute that, that was about two figures kind of intertwined. But um, he then, I believe, came, came to kind of the realization that he wasn't going to be able to commit to both both things in a way and you know if if he wanted to put his all into art making then that was he was going to have to sacrifice the uh, <clears throat> the kind of relationships and family side of things um but yeah I mean I assume it can't have been an easy decision and it was something he thought about a lot and I suppose it can be seen reflected in the fact that he also made this series of work which I uh, mentioned um relating to embryonic kind of images and and things like that which he studied in the British Museum mm -hmm. library I guess that must have been a kind of reflection on on that kind of thing as well but yeah I don't know if if um if Leanne or any of the other listeners have anything to comment on that but that's that's kind of what I mm -hmm. know and what I gleaned from interviews that he gave um mm -hmm. during his lifetime yeah um I actually um, I was fascinated looking a bit, little bit into, uh, into his work in preparation of, of this talk, um, how much um, values, uh, ethic and moral values uh, that he must have gotten through his religious upbringing, he carried throughout his life. Um, you know, the, um, he uh, in a way, he was a very, very Jewish artist mm. in terms of his uh, in terms of his values and the conflicts that he had with, the, uh, for example, with uh, depicting the figure. And uh, mm. um, so um, it almost seems as if he's holding on to his to his roots by making it, you know, making these values such a big part of his art making um, and also, you know, later on um, uh, his concern for um, for the environment against, you know, um, against war, against, you know, mm -hmm. all these all these political uh, those those things that were politically important to him um, resonate a lot of um, I think a lot of his Jewish um, roots. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think, you know, um, the trauma obviously resulting from having um, escaped Nuremberg and his family, you know, many of them perishing, definitely resonated and, and um, it can be seen kind of to, to echo throughout his career um, and as you say that you know holding on very deeply to a concern for the past and um, and how important that was and um, he want yeah he was a deeply kind of uh, principled and, and, and caring person in terms of um, you know being an activist and an environmentalist and um, and and you know caring a lot about destruction and extinction and trying to prevent those things and shine a light on those things as much as possible. Um, yeah, so I, I would agree with you there. Yeah, true. So David um, uh, says, Bromberg was, if I see this correctly, someone who brought the figure forcefully and somehow 
defiantly back into modernism and spawned part of the London School. Do you think that Metzger's move into more abstract territory was part of the rift between him and Bomberg? Um, I'm not sure because, I mean, he does say that he was making abstract work during the time that he was close with Bomberg. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that's that's the case. What what really did mark the shift when he when he split from Bomberg was the not using the the brush anymore and using his fingers and the palette knife and um, and yeah from the sort of table series and um, more yeah I guess more more sort of geometric style abstract works. But he could be considered to have been working abstractly before. The then uh, just not quite in the same vein um so yeah i mean the, sh the the break with bomberg did obviously precipitate a number of things and a number of changes in his practice but i wouldn't necessarily say a move away from the figure was one of those because he did feel that um for example that girl at hunt stanton painting that i showed you a very dark painting he you know whilst to the viewer it does look abstract he definitely perceived that to be a figurative painting um and and painted others similar to that, or at least one other similar to that at the time. So, mm -hmm. and that was that was in the late fifties, um, several years after after his break with Bomberg. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so we have two more questions, which is perfect, perfectly within our timing. Um, um, Marty is asking, how did Metzger come to believe that art can change the larger society when an understanding of his artworks meaning requires what might be called an elitist um, art education? Sorry, I didn't quite hear the last part of the question. How did Metzger come to believe that art can change the larger society when an understanding of his artworks meaning requires what might be called an elit uh, elitist art education? Um, I mean, he came to the realization that art could change society quite early on because he, you know, in, in the early 40s even was immersed in um, kind of radical literature and was looking at Eric Gill and other Marxist um, writers and initially that's where the tussle was between being revolutionary and being an artist but um i think he saw them coming together even even then um i wouldn't necessarily agree that his work requires an elitist education though i take that as an interesting point i mean i think um especially his later work which is not the subject of of this talk or, or, or the exhibition, but that was very much um, big statements relating, um, you know, t to revolutionary kinds of things. Um, and w would I, th I mean, I would have thought that he would have felt those were quite immediate and obvious um, points um, from the kind of destructive work that began with the acid on nylon to sort of bigger, um, happenings and projects involving cars and fumes and newspapers and things like that. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if um, right. that answered the question. <laughs> of course. Um, so uh, the question, um, the questions keep coming in are the comments. So, uh, Ronak says, Gustav lived together with a person named Cordula in the mid 1980s. I've seen a picture of them together at the Staatsgalerie in Stuttgart in 1986. So that uh, kind of hints at, uh, goes beyond your uh, period of research, but kind of uh, uh, answers part of the question that I asked you. Mm -hmm. um, so, and Robert uh, says a big influence on Bomberg was his visits to Jerusalem during the British mandate in the 1920s. Gil was never a Marxist, but an ardent Roman Catholic convert. So um, that's, uh, those are the two comments. And now I have a final question uh, by Stephanie. What brought Metzger's work to you? What went, went into your decision to write about him? 
Oh, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, um, Metzger had been someone that I was thinking about for a while. Um, I saw him speak at St. Martin's and I think it was 2012, um, along with London Fieldworks, um, who worked on a project with him called Null Object. Um, and Joe is actually going to be speaking um, at one of our uh, August events, um, actually. So check that out. But um, yeah, I think from that time, he he kind of was in my mind. And then um, I uh, was thinking about doing a symposium and approached the foundation and initially was thinking then a few years ago about just the drawings kind of uh, from this Bombo period. Um, and exhibiting them in the um, at LSBU, which is which was the Borough Polytechnic, where he obviously had had lessons with Bomberg. And then, um, yeah, the, the the project really evolved, and um, Ben Yuri gave me uh, you know the amazing opportunity to um, to bring Metzger there, and um, I felt that it was it was important to show the early work rather than. Um, the mid or later work, which is which is also kind of quite difficult to show within um, within a small space and, and requires recreating and things. So um, yeah, it sort of evolved over a few years, but um, really delighted um, with the opportunity to to be able to have the exhibition at Benieri. And as I said, we we will have a larger online offering of also available on on the Benieri website in due course. So. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, and you actually Ben Ori is doing quite some um, uh, groundbreaking work in installing a virtual uh, as a itself as a virtual museum. So expanding from their physical space into larger uh, virtual uh, offerings. So I I personally find that very very interesting and uh, absolutely yeah. There are a lot of online exhibitions um, available to view at benuri.org. So yeah yeah thank you so much nicola for your work on behalf of gustav metzger and for sharing with us your insights into the artist's life and work um stay healthy everyone and uh be well and stay in touch goodbye thank you